It can happen anywhere, and it does, usually in the same way. Moist, warm air from the south overruns cold air from the north. The warm air is forced aloft, and a thunderstorm forms. Rain begins falling beneath the northeastern part of the storm, and then large hail, a tip-off of something far worse. At the southwest edge of the storm, almost always at that place, a dark, low-hanging cloud begins to churn. Out of it suddenly comes something frightening, a tornado funnel. Abruptly, it touches down, spinning at more than 200 miles an hour, moving, growing, scooping up debris. Sometimes there is one funnel, sometimes several. Sometimes funnels are obscured by rain or darkness. Tornadoes may appear as transparent dust clouds, thin gray ropes, or black, wide-mouthed monsters. Whatever their shape, tornadoes grind across the nation year after year, bringing terror, death, and destruction. Since 1950, NOAA records show tornadoes have struck every state in the Union, killing thousands and injuring more than 100,000. But far fewer die or are injured when people are prepared. Most of them were ready when one of the biggest tornadoes ever seen struck Wichita Falls, Texas. It was an April afternoon, the one they call Terrible Tuesday. We'd had tornado warnings all afternoon, and we were headed to the mall, and we just did not think that a tornado was going to hit where we were. Mona Partham and her husband were caught in the open by the tornado and survived, but just barely. They abandoned their car near a church and tried to cling to a tree. I remember spinning around the tree, and the next thing I know, I, we were sitting up on the curb. A gentleman at a pickup passed us, and I happened to raise my hand up. And he stopped, and he and another gentleman from the ravine helped us into the pickup, took us to the hospital, where they amputated my right leg below the knee, a couple of weeks later, I was flown to a Dallas hospital where they amputated my left leg above the knee. James Montgomery was luckier. I got up to speeds of 70 to 75 miles an hour in my station wagon, and as I crested the hill, I realized that the tornado was still immediately behind me, and I was not gaining any distance at all. Realizing that I could not outrun it, I started looking for some type of protection, either the culvert or about that time I thought of the wedge shape up underneath the overpass as a possible source of protection. We ran to the paved area underneath the overpass and started running up toward the wedge and by that time the wind was so strong that I just spread eagle on the concrete to create the lowest profile. I immediately looked out from under the overpass and saw the National Guard Armory completely disintegrate. And when the winds finally subsided, all the cars that had pulled in and parked under the overpass had been blown and were stacked up on one another. And I started looking for my automobile, and I found it a quarter of a mile down the expressway in this condition. Norma Wright walked outside her gift shop just as the tornado struck. She grabbed a construction scaffold and hung on. Suddenly the wind was not a wind anymore. It was a very solid force. I heard the sound of my voice as the air was pulled from my lungs. Um, the sensations were of being pounded and hit and stabbed. It was violent. It was very, very violent. And my intention at that time was not so much to live as it was to be able to endure whatever I had to endure until the end, whatever 
that was going to be. But I guess instinctively I held on to the base of that scaffolding. Um, injuries were severe. All four limbs were severely injured. Um, my left leg was off, just below the knee. Uh, my right arm was torn uh, from elbow to wrist. My left arm was broken. And my right leg was both uh, broken in several places and lacerated to the bone from knee to ankle. Isla Benson and six other employees of her bank rode out the tornado in the bank's reinforced steel and concrete vault. This was the bank. They had sounded the tornado sirens that afternoon, but we really didn't pay any attention to them till I made a call home to my son, and he said, Mom, there is a bad storm coming, so t please take cover. So seven of us employees went into the vault, and we knelt on the floor, and we could hear this roaring sound. And then all of a sudden, we just felt like we was going to explode and our ears needed popping. So we stayed there for a while till everything got quiet. And then we got up and we looked out and we just couldn't believe what we saw because there the cars that were in the parking lot were now in the bank's lobby and there was no bank left. Forty-six people died in Wichita Falls that Tuesday. It was a very small number considering the path a mile and a half wide at the tornado cut through the town. Yet many died unnecessarily. About half were killed because they tried to escape in cars and trucks, one of the very worst things they could have done. Most of the people of Wichita Falls know better. Their city has an outstanding disaster plan. Mark Wilson is the director. The city annually conducts a disaster exercise involving all of the city departments and divisions as well as the total medical community. Uh, we have found over the years uh, that the disaster drill uh, has greatly enhanced our capability of dealing with a disaster. Uh, many researchers came into our city following the, uh, the disaster and without exception each one of those uh, researchers uh, concluded that uh, we should have had perhaps as many as 2,000 fatalities. Mark Wilson reviews the city's plan with other members of his team. If the, the tornado or the disaster actually strikes us, we're certainly going to be calling upon the American Red Cross, uh, the broadcast media, and the church and uh, community groups who will be interfacing. Once we've exhausted all of those resources that are available to us locally, uh, at that time and only at that time, will we then go to the State Division of Emergency Management and call upon state for their resources. Once those resources uh, have been exhausted, uh, then we can go to the Federal Emergency Management Agency and bring in national resources. As a center, we, we coordinate with the Wichita Falls National uh, Weather Service, uh, and through their Skywarn spotters, they feed information into the Emergency Operations Center of the City of Wichita Falls. So that we... A tornado warning is issued by the local National Weather Service office after the spotters see it touch down. The spotters, many of them amateur radio operators, are deployed after a tornado watch has been sounded. All watches are issued from one place, the National Severe Storms Forecast Center in Kansas City, Missouri. Here, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, expert forecasters keep watch over all parts of the nation with satellites and radar. The director of the center is Fred Ostby. As part of the National Weather Service uh, mission in saving lives and property, we're here to issue tornado or severe thunderstorm watches for any area in the lower 48 states where the threat appears. And we're looking at time periods two to six hours ahead of time before thunderstorms or even some of the thunder clouds develop. 
Uh, I'm looking at the western half of the United States, so we're seeing what actually is being seen from the satellite at 22,000 miles above the equator. We can also look at these satellite pictures, which were looping back and forth over a period of about two hours to show the motion of the clouds, so we can see the clouds as they develop and as they move. We can also look at these clouds in the infrared spectrum, that is, by measuring the temperature of the cloud tops, we can uh, infer how the clouds are developing and moving here. And this is very important to us because uh, obviously at nighttime we can't look at the visible clouds, but by infrared we can follow cloud development 24 hours a day. Uh, another important aspect of this kind of interactive computer system is that we can actually superimpose right on top of the satellite picture uh, conventional weather data such as sea level pressures, uh, barometric pressures, where high and low pressure areas are superimposed right on top of the satellite picture. The Severe Storms Forecast Center uses today's technology to monitor the nation's weather. At NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma, Roger Brown and other professionals are developing tomorrow's technology. The National Severe Storms Laboratory here at Norman was established in order to take advantage of the severe weather that occurs in this part of the country. One relatively new piece of information is Doppler radar. Doppler radar is like a conventional radar in that it tells us where the rain is falling in storms, but it also tells us how the air is moving. On this Doppler display, we see the conventional radar reflectivity pattern that you see on regular weather radars. The colors going from the outside of the radar echo toward the yellow and dark red in the center indicates where the heavier and heavier rainfall is occurring. However, we found out from our spotters in the field that a tornado, a large tornado, was taking place at this time, but there's really no indication in the radar reflectivity pattern that a tornado is occurring, and even knowing that it's occurring, we really can't tell where it is. Now, if we look at the Doppler velocity display, we see a very pronounced signature, bright green next to bright red. That signature is an indication of that very large tornado. Radar is a strong link in the weather safety chain. Here is another link. Al Moeller, a weather service meteorologist, visits a home in Wichita Falls to advise a family on tornado safety. Normally, he speaks to public groups rather than individual families. But a local TV station wants to produce a program on how to create a tornado safety plan at home. After looking at uh, your house, uh, I really think that this interior bathroom is, as you had previously noted, the best shelter within the house. Uh, the rule of thumb that we use is put as many walls between you and the tornado as you can. And this is an all interior room. It's very small. And the smaller the room, the more protection it offers. So this is excellent shelter. And make sure you have something to cover your heads. OK. And then, of course, we close the bathroom door. If yes, the house had a basement, Moeller would have chosen that as the shelter. How are you going to receive the warning? Say you're in bed at night, and the weather service and uh, local emergency preparedness people do strongly recommend that you have a weather radio, which is tone alert equipped. Now, you get weather information 24 hours a day on this, especially watches and warning, warnings, which you're interested in. If you get the tone alert feature, you don't have to have the radio on when we issue a watch or warning for the local area. But what happens when we put that warning statement on the air we activate a beeper on the system. As you can see, it's very loud, and you won't have any trouble hearing this even in the dead of sleep in the middle of the night. Yeah. We strongly recommend that all families have it, uh, as well as schools, uh, businesses, industrial complexes. Classes are in session at the Ben Milam Elementary School. The school suffered heavy damage from the giant tornado, though the inside corridor remained intact. Luckily, it was spring vacation and no one was there. Today, NOAA Weather Radio is a vital tool in school safety. This is a test of the NOAA Weather Radio warning device. Repeat, this is a test. Principal Bill Parks regularly rehearses the school's disaster plan. Thank you. 
of the storm, you'll see the brightly lit thunder. If another tornado visits Wichita Falls, a tornado warning will activate the school's disaster plan. And it will most often be based on what a spotter sees. A human eye. We simply cannot do without spotters. Even in the future, when we have Doppler radars all over the country, we will not be able to do without spotters and that human element. So the machines help us a lot, but we've got to have the man-machine mix in this program to accurately get to the public what is about to happen to them. This is WB5SXX uh, out at the state. The man who first spotted the Tuesday tornado uh, was Glenn Watley. Uh, Watley was assigned to the stadium. Other spotters were deployed around the city when the tornado watch was issued by the Severe Storms Forecast Center in early afternoon. Other spotters were stationed at the local weather office. All were linked by amateur radio. The media repeatedly warned residents in the 11 county area. The network of spotters came busily to light. A few minutes later, the horror begins. To save lives and prevent injuries, all of us should learn the safety rules that saved thousands of people in Wichita Falls, Texas, on an April afternoon, the day they call Terrible Tuesday. Thank you.